Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you thanking you, Lord, for all that you've done, how great you are. Lord, our minds are set on you, and Father, we thank you for being God over our lives and all the love that you've shown us, the kindness that you've shown us, the mercy and the grace that you've shown us. Father, we are appreciative. So, Father, tonight we thank you that by your Spirit you will minister unto us. We declare that no flesh will be glorified. We thank you, Lord, that our hearts are good ground and that we receive the seed of your word to fall on this ground, to take root and bring forth fruit that is pleasing and acceptable unto you. Lord, we give you thanks, we give you praise for a life lived by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come on, let's give God praise one more time. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. You all may be seated. Uh, of course, starting out, giving honors to Dr. Dollar and Pastor Taffy and always thanking God so much uh, for them. As I said, if you don't see them in this pulpit, they are fulfilling uh, the assignments that God has called them to fulfill. And um, we can't be stingy. Amen. <laughs> we can't be stingy with them. They have been called to the world and um, praise God. So we have to put them on loan sometimes. Uh, we do that, but amen. They're out fulfilling the will of God for their lives, and, and uh, we thank God for them and honor them tonight. Uh, going to go ahead on and get right into Word, uh, because of course, as we, uh, when we're talking about Wednesday night, we only have just a, a, a short amount of time. So I'd like to go ahead on and dive, uh, dive into it. I've been doing this series uh, entitled Mastering Your Thought Life. And, um, you know, it's been a blessing to me. It's, it's one thing to be a blessing to somebody else, but, you know, I mean, your word should minister to you first. Amen? <laughs> Before you get up and try to preach it to somebody else, it should actually minister to you first. And, uh, and the word of God has been ministering to me. My life has been changing in so many different ways. I am still excited about my walk with God as if I just got born again yesterday. I mean, you know, it... it <sighs> Yeah, you know, I've been in it for a long time, but God is always fresh. Oh, yeah. God is always fresh. I mean, he's always new. I mean, how can God ever get stale yeah. in, in our lives? It's, no, God isn't getting stale. It's, we've gotten stale with our relationship with him. But I'm excited about what he's doing. And, and the message on this thought life, mastering the thought life, um, has taken me into a, a different dimension. I, I've... I've gotten to the point now where, you know, I feel that I'm becoming more proficient in things because I'm able to control my thoughts. Uh, I'm not just under the circumstances. My thoughts are controlling the circumstances. I'm not just, um, you know, subject to whatever may come. And then that determines my attitude, that determines the way I feel. No, I've changed that. My thinking is set on God's word, so therefore I change my situation, and I'm able to do that. And so are you. You're able to do that as well. See, there's something about when God, God gives us this voice of victory and this position of victory, it's not just a feel-good thing. It's a, it's a reality thing. It's like, I want, you, I want you to live this. I want people to see your life so that they will become inquisitive. How is it that you're not bothered when they say that they're closing down the plant? How come you're not bothered? How come you're not bothered when, you know, when I know you just got a bad di diagnosis? How come you're not bothered? Why is it that these things don't bother you? Well, there's a reason. Amen? And we'll get into that. But as we, we talked, the last time we talked, um, and I'm trying to think, I think that may have, that may have been a uh, Wednesday morning session, but I entitled it How to Control Your Thoughts. And I just want to go over that just real quickly just to give just a, a brief foundation that we'll still go from here. But when you talk about controlling your thoughts, we went to Proverbs 23.7. Uh, that's as a man thinketh in his heart. So is his life. So the way that you think is the way that your life is going to be. 
So if you don't have control over your thought life, your life will be like a reed that's shaken in the wind. Just whatever hits you, you find yourself going with whatever, whatever's going, hey, oh, you know what I'm saying? You just, you just go on with whatever it is. And, uh, and we got we to gotta fix that. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But we now got to control the way that we think. We also talked in Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24, where we, we, we submitted our thinking to the Lord. Try me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me, Lord, and lead me in the way everlasting. We submit our thoughts unto the Lord. So therefore, we're saying, God, help me to control my thoughts. Look at my thoughts that I have now. Are they good? Or are they bad? The bad ones help me to control, Lord. You can, you can search me and try my heart. Second Corinthians, uh, the 10th chapter and the 5th verse, we talked about how we capture bad thoughts and bring them in subjection to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, talk about doing that, how we uh, capture uh, every thought and bring it unto the obedience of Christ. How do we capture those thoughts? We capture those thoughts by, first of all, first of all, recognizing that they are bad thoughts and then taking the Word of God, which is supreme, and conquering that thought. So if the thought is, just in simplicity, if the thought is, you know, go and steal that, that piece of candy, well, the Word of God comes up and says, no, thou shalt not steal. We're not going to steal that candy. So I defeated that thought by going with the Word of God, thou shalt not steal. So we have to capture these bad thoughts and bring them into uh, subjection to the Word of God. Romans 12, 2. Um, tells us, in essence, quit thinking like the world and reacting like the world and renew our minds to the things of God. So the other way we control our thoughts is by having our minds renewed to a new way of thinking. Then we went to Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the 12th verse. And basically what that says is the word of God is quick, powerful, sharp, and any two-edged sword. And then it goes on down into the latter part of that verse and it said the word of God is able to discern our thoughts. The Word of God is able to discern our thoughts. That word discern means skillfully judge or to judge skillfully. So the Word of God judges our thoughts and determines that they are right or wrong, good or bad. So then when we submit our thoughts to the Word of God, it judges it, and now we're able to put the bad ones in a category by themselves, and once they're in that bad category, let's get rid of them and capture them and bring them unto the obedience of Christ. Third, uh, then it talks about in Romans 8, 5, we went over that, how we, those who mind or have the thoughts of the flesh, will fulfill the things of the flesh, but those who have the mind or the thoughts of the spirit will fulfill the things of the spirit. So we mind or we set our mind or our thinking on the things of the spirit and not on the things of the flesh. And then lastly, uh, Colossians, the third chapter and the second verse, Colossians 3, 2. It says, if you then be risen with Christ. Now, that's everybody who's born again. If you then be, been risen with Christ, set your thoughts on things above. How do you capture your thoughts? You set them. You set them on things above. Or the Bible says, set them on heavenly things. So we do those things there. That's how we get control over our thoughts. But today I want to talk about good thoughts for bad times. Good thoughts for bad times. Now, um, I don't even have to ask everybody to raise their hand. I know everybody has experienced a bad time. If you live long enough, you've had an evil day. If you've lived long enough, you've probably had evil days. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that you're bad because you experience an evil day. It just means that that's the way that this thing has been set up and this thing has been worked out that you know, God was true with us. He didn't hide anything from us. He told us up front. Up front. In fact, let's, let's look at the scriptures here. Let's look at uh, James 1, 1, 12. Well, in fact, uh, uh, I'm saving time. Y'all write these down, okay? <laughs> Go back and uh, look, look at them yourself. But James 1, 12. 
Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. When he is tried, it's not a matter of if, it's when you're going to be tried. John 16, we went over this before as well. John 16, in this world, you're going to have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So like I've said before, God wouldn't hide anything from us. Somebody started lying on God saying that if you get born again, you ain't going to ever deal with no trouble. I don't know where that lie came from. Because I was like, God, I must be doing this wrong then. I surely been running into trouble. Then 1 Peter 4.12, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. It didn't say it, it might. It is. You're going to have fiery trials, and they're going to try you. And then 2 Timothy 3.12, he says, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. How many of y'all are, are living godly in Christ Jesus? Amen. How many of y'all want to live godly? <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Amen. We're, by faith, we're all living godly in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, now that, that puts you in the category. You, you're going to suffer persecution. Because, see, you're in a world, the Bible calls Satan the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It says the God of this world, or the God of this world system. Now we know, not, we know that he's not the God of the earth because the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and, and all that dwells therein. But the, the Satan is the God of this world system. So as we live in this world and we operate in this system, we're going to, um, you know, you, you're going to deal with persecution. So these things are happening in our, in our lives, but the thing about it is, is, will you be victim, a victim of the circumstances? It's a choice. Because you have the ability to overcome, it now becomes a choice. If you did not have the ability to overcome, it would not be a choice. You just be a victim to it and you wouldn't have any say so. But we have a choice. Now, with that, many people, some, this one person called me uh, winning Pastor Ken. <laughs> winning Pastor Ken. Amen. I, I, I agree. I agree. That's right. Wonder why. Why? Because. What do I say? We win, we win, we win. So you all know my motto. That's my motto. The thing about my motto is it didn't just come off the top of my head. I got a revelation of that. And then I started saying, we win, we win, we win. Because I found in the scriptures, as I kept reading, I was like, oh, we win right there? We win right there? We went right there, we went right there, we went right there, we went right there. I, I was saying we win. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my mouth to what the scripture is telling me. We win, we win, we win. So then when it says in 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 2.14, you all know that. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to what? To triumph. What's triumph? Winning. So he says... Thanks be unto God who always causes me to win. This is what Paul was saying. So it's like if I win, then I need to be saying that I win. Amen. Now, you're going to see times where Pastor Ken don't look like he's winning. <laughs> it's just real life. But in spiritual reality, in Christ, I always win. Amen. Even when it looks like I'm losing, Amen. I'm still winning. So now, I now have to have the mindset that no matter what I'm facing, I win. Well, you're just trying to be too spiritual. Call it what you want, okay? <laughs> What's the song? You can call it what you want. Mm -hmm. Down, 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 down. Amen. Some of y'all know that song, but you can call it what you want. But the thing is, is that I win. 
okay? I don't care what you might think. I don't care how you might look at me. You may look at me and say, Pastor Ken, you don't look like you went in a day. That's all right. We don't go by what it looks like. Amen. Amen. We're going by what the Bible says, which is thanks be unto God who always causes me. Yes. Now, you got to get personal with it. It's up to you. Yes. But for me, he causes me to win. So now, what I have now developed is a mindset. I got a mindset. One thing that I have little patience for, but I will generate patience because I have to have empathy as well, but I have little patience for people who have a victim mentality. It just rubs me. Sometimes I'll be like, okay, God, help me because I, I know who we are in Christ and I don't know why this person is trying to hold on to this victim mentality. Like, poor old me. I, you know, oh my God. Well, you know, I hope the Lord hears what I said. He, he, of course he hears what you say. He been hear you saying that you don't believe him. That's what he's been hearing you say. Stop saying that and start saying what the Bible says. But I have very little patience Though I will have empathy if I run into somebody with that, I want to quickly get them out of that mindset. To get them out of the mindset of being the victims, you all have heard me say we're not the, uh, we're the victors and not the victims. Amen? This is a mindset that I have developed. So I refuse to have a defeated or victim's mentality, and that winning mindset is formed. It's formed. It wasn't just a, a natural occurrence when I got saved. It wasn't just something that just, you know, God said, woo, take that. No, it's, it's formed. It's developed. It's thinking. Now, you know, I don't want to give you all the impression like I got it all together. You know, I, I still have trials and tribulations and hard times and, you know, and the devil might get a sucker punch in there every now and then. You know, when you get a sucker punch in there, you might, you might see me do that. But you're going to see me come on up again, too. Amen? So, you know, you might get a punch in there. It's, you know, that might happen sometimes. It's, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I win the battle. Amen? And I will eventually win the war. But the thing is, I'm going to win. So, you know, things like that happen. But it's forming that mindset. And we know this isn't just a mental exercise of just speaking positively, that's good, but I got to have faith in what I'm saying. I know this is elementary, man, but I promise you, it is the little foxes that destroy the vine. It's the little things that we don't tend to focus on that that causes us sometimes to lose. It's, it's, It's the little things. But if we, if we understand that when we are saying something, when we are confessing, when we're speaking the word, we got to have faith in those words. Now, what is faith in those words? First of all, the word of God really is your faith. You don't have to muster up faith. If you take the word of God and just take it for what it is, that's your faith. That's your faith. It's not hard. It's not difficult. It's not like I got to go over here and try to, you know, uh, fast and pray for 30, 40 days to generate faith. No, the word of God is faith. And if we start, if we take it for faith value, then you're in, you're in faith. So we, we got to make sure that we're doing that. Now, the thing that keeps me in this, um, I will say, keep me in that mindset of victory is there are two things that I mainly focus on. It's hope and it's peace. There are more. There are more. But the two things that I focus on is hope and peace. Now, I shared this uh, uh, a time before, but I'm going to say this again real quickly because I've got some other things I want to move on to. Let's talk about hope. The problem with hope There's no problem with hope in terms of biblical hope. There's a problem with hope in terms of worldly hope. So when we, most of the time, when the church uses the definition of hope, we use the world's definition of hope. The world's definition of hope, 
Hope is a desire for some future thing. This is the world's definition. A desire for some future thing. I've shared this before. Which we are uncertain of attaining or it happening. Okay? If your gas hand is on E and you're riding and you know the nearest gas station is 10 miles away, you are hoping that you can make it to the gas station. You're not sure, but you're hoping. <laughs> and man, I mean, you're, you're looking at that gas hand like, you know, it's like, don't move, don't move, don't, don't move, don't move. Because you all know how it is. When it get on E and then it start getting behind E, oh, you're in trouble now. But you're hoping. That's, a, that's an uncertain thing that you don't, you're not sure if it'll happen, but you're hoping that it does. So that's the world's definition of hope. And sometimes we will say, well, will God meet your needs? I hope so. We've applied the world's definition of hope to the word of God. Wrong. Okay? Because he promised, he said, I'll supply all your needs according to what? Riches and glory. So what do we mean we hope he will when he said, I will? Why, why are we hoping for that, which he's already promised? Good. Good. So when we look at hope in the Bible, and I don't have time to, to go deep into this. I'm just kind of giving the, the surface of it. When we look at hope in the Bible, don't apply the world's definition of hope in terms of uncertainty. Apply the biblical definition of hope, which is certainty. The difference is, Biblical definition of hope talks about a future event, just like the world's definition, a future event. You know, I gave this, gave this analogy, will the Falcons win the Super Bowl? <laughs> Uncertain. Hope so. You know. <laughs> Lord have mercy. All right. But, but you guys got what I'm saying. It's, it's a future thing that you're hoping will happen. But the thing about it, when hope is mentioned in the Bible, it is a future thing that we know will happen. It is a certainty that that's going to happen. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. See, when you take the world's definition, but when you take the biblical definition, for sure. I hope Jesus is coming back. What you really mean is that there is a future event that I am very sure of shall come to pass, okay? So when I think of hope, my mindset, my thoughts are, if he said he'll supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, I don't see that right now, but my hope is, is that it will happen, biblical hope. So. It will happen because he said, I will do that. So it's going to come to pass. It's just now I put into practice peace that keeps me while my hope manifests. Praise God. So now I have this peace that calms my mind. That peace says, I've got to regulate your thought life because if you don't let me regulate your thought life, what's going to happen is, it's worry is going to get up there. Yeah. It's going to get up there and then you're going to start worrying about it because you don't know what's going to happen. You're unsure. But peace, and let me give you the definition of this peace real quickly. Whew, man, that time gets, time gets to going. Yeah, All right, so peace. Peace means calm and tranquility of soul in the midst of peaceful situation. That's the world's definition. Calm and tranquility of soul or mind in the midst of peaceful situations. Hey, when everything's going good, everybody's at peace. Everything's going good. You know, everybody's going, getting an ice cream cone. They're walking their dogs. You know, they're doing, they're walking in the rain with the one they love. You know, it's all this stuff that's, that's going on. But 
the world's definition of peace is calm and tranquility in the midst of peaceful situations. Here's the biblical definition of peace. The biblical definition of peace is Jesus. <laughs> Truthfully, really, it's, it's Jesus. Uh, the Bible says Jesus who is our peace. Uh, it says that, and then Jesus says in John that uh, my peace I leave with you, not as the world leave, leave I you. So he makes the di distinction between I got a peace and the world has a peace. They're, they're two separate. Not as the world give you peace, I give you a separate, different kind of peace. Now, but here's the thing. It is similar in definition of the world's peace. Very similar. Watch this. Biblical peace is calm and tranquility of soul in the midst of uh, peaceful, that's almost word for word, the exact same definition I just gave you of the world, right? Here's the difference. Or, <laughs> in the midst of peaceful or difficult circumstances. So therefore, the peace that comes from Jesus is not subject to peaceful situations. The peace that comes from the world is subject to peaceful situations. Because if you take away the peaceful situations from the definition of the world, you've now lost your peace because it's not a peaceful situation. But if you have the definition that Jesus has, which is calm and tranquility in the midst of peaceful or difficult situations, you still have peace. So then that makes it where it's not subject to the situation because Jesus is your peace. So regardless of where you find yourself, in the midst of a fiery furnace, you still can have peace. In the midst of a bad relationship, you still can have peace. In the midst of your children being knuckleheads, you still can have peace. In the midst of whatever it is that you're dealing with, you still can have peace because your peace is not subject to the circumstance or the situation. Now, when I now let that become my thought process, I don't look at the things that are happening. I focus on what I'm thinking on, which is Jesus is my peace, regardless, 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 Jesus is my peace. That's why somebody can say, why is it that you're, you're calm when they just gave everybody the pink slip? <laughs> Jesus is my peace. See, I got good thoughts in bad times, good thoughts in bad times. So now, with that, we have thoughts of peace while hope is being manifested. Thoughts of peace while hope is being manifested. This is the difference here of having a good thought, good thoughts in bad times. So everybody has bad times. We all have to deal with these things. But listen to this. <clears throat> God wants us to still be in control of the state of our thoughts, even though you can do nothing about your circumstance. Now, some of y'all said, what do you mean? That's again, you just said we can change our circumstances. True. There are some circumstances that you can change, and then there are other circumstances that you can't. That's the truth of the matter. Truth of the matter is, you may find yourself having been fired. You can change, that was beyond your control. The company decided to whatever, shut down and, and, and do that. Could you change that circumstance? No. Couldn't do nothing, couldn't do nothing with it. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> you couldn't do anything about that. Um, you were born in a dysfunctional family. Can't do nothing about that. I was just born in here. I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't like I knocked on my mom's womb and said, hey, you know what, can I switch over and go somewhere else? No, you were just, you were born into that. There are, there are circumstances that you just can't change. But the thing about it is, 
Can you still be in control of, your, of the state of your thoughts even though you can't do anything about your circumstances? Can you still be in control of the state of your thoughts even though you can't do anything about your circumstances? The answer is yes, we can. We can because, listen, let, let me share something with you. Man, that clock is like intimidating, boys. Just keep, keep looking at me. Um, let's, let's go to this. I want to share something with you. Isaiah 55, uh, 7 through 9, and we're going we're gonna to read this real quickly, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 11 through 12. Isaiah 55, 7 through 9, we'll read that in the King James. And then um, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 12, we'll read that in the New Living Translation. So Isaiah 55, verse 7. <clears throat> it says, let the wicked, I want you to focus on that wicked. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. The wicked and the unrighteous. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Next verse. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Whose thoughts? The wicked person thought. The unrighteous person thought. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways saith the Lord. Next verse. For as the heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, we will use this to say that, you know, we don't know God's thoughts. We can't think the way God thinks. And I know I got a lot of y'all now because y'all went silent on me. It's like, <laughs> it's all cool. It's, it's cool. It's all right. It said, let the wicked, let the unrighteous forsake his thoughts and, and the wicked man his ways. For my thoughts are not your ways, the wicked man. Excuse me, my ways are not your ways, the wicked man. My thoughts are not your thoughts, the unrighteous man. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and all that. Okay, so now don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying like we got God's brain. You know, that's, that's, not what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, he's God. He's in. His, to try to even take one iota of the capacity of God, just you talk about blow your head would explode. You, you can't deal with it. But there's something about this in terms of our thoughts that we need to think about. Um... So you guys got that, okay? The wicked, the unrighteous, our thoughts are not your thoughts, our ways are higher than your ways. I think sometimes we can take these scriptures and kind of use them as a, an excuse or uh, use them in a way that it lessens who God has made us to be. It causes us to go down a few pegs beyond the rightful place of the peg where you should be because we misunderstood it and we missed our place of it. All right, so he said that. Now let's go to that other scripture I told you to go to. What was it? 1 Corinthians 2, 11. New Living Translation. For no man, no one can know a person's thoughts except what? That, that person's own spirit. That's, that's, you know, don't nobody know your thoughts like you. That's what it's saying. You know your thoughts better than anybody else can come and know your thoughts. Why? Because you live with them. He said that no one can know God's thoughts except what? God's own spirit, right? Now, we just read that your thoughts ain't my thoughts. Your ways ain't my ways. But now it's talking about no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Now, hold on, don't go, don't go to the next one. We would say that supports what we just read, right? We'd say, hey, he just said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. 
But he says the only person who really knows God's thoughts, who what? God's spirit, Holy Spirit. Next verse. And we have received God's spirit. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, there's some stuff in that Bible. We go back and read. It's like we dust that stuff off. It's like, oh my goodness, how long you been there? Like all the while, I just waiting for you to read it. <laughs> but we have God's spirit, don't we? Y'all, y'all born again. Y'all got the Holy Ghost, right? That's God's spirit. There ain't no other spirit besides the Holy Spirit. So we got the Holy Spirit. It says not the world spirit, but this is why we have the Holy Spirit, so we can know. That's good. <laughs> so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Amen. Amen. Man, God ain't holding back on you. He ain't holding back on you. God's like, I, you know, I was telling somebody uh, Sunday, we were <laughs> just talking. God is so, he's so intent on giving you his stuff. Hear me, hear me when I say this. God is so intent. He, he's not trying to hold anything back from us. He's not trying to make us go over the river and through the woods to get it to us. He's like, no, I already did that when I, when, when I allowed my son to die for you so you can have access to this. And then I also gave you my spirit so you can have access to this. The problem is, is that you keep thinking, I don't want to give it to you. And he's like, I, I, you don't know how badly I want to give this to you. I'll tell you how badly I want to give it to you. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole world looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. He's like, I'm just looking for people. I'm just looking for people. That's all I'm doing. That's, that's 2 Chronicles 16, 9, if you want to go back and read that. He, he said, I'm, he said I'm, 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 I'm searching the earth that I can give my stuff to. Now imagine this. This is the way God showed me. He said, he said, Ken, I got to spread. He said, I got, I got to spread, man. I mean, this is, this is collard greens and yams and, and ham, ham hocks and pig feet. You know, we, we ain't in the law no more, right? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's like, I got to spread. If you can imagine this huge banquet table, I'm talking about a banquet table, probably the length of this room of just food. And he says, that's for you, Ken. Me? You don't mean for somebody else, you know, a whole bunch of other folks we need to invite in? No, that's for you. But you know, this is how I insult God. I gave you all of this. God, I'll just take a nibble. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. He's like, seriously? I got all of this for you, and that's all you're doing is nibbling? That's the way we are with the things that God has for us. We're just nibbling. We're just nibbling. Man, we need to be throwing down. I ain't talking about gluttony or anything like that. You all understand what I'm saying. God has made all this stuff available for us. He's saying, take advantage of it. Use it. What do you think I'm doing with it up here in heaven? It's, it's just stored up here. It needs to be used. Can you imagine having a warehouse of goods that just is never used? God wants to get this to us. But see, our thinking, we got to know how to apply the good thoughts in these bad times. 